Hi, it's Friday, September the 17th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Matthew's Gospel. And all week we've been in Matthew chapter 24, an apocalyptic vision um, uh, that Jesus shares in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, today we're going to finish off chapter 24, so it's Matthew 24, 36 to 51. Um, yeah, all week we've been hearing about uh, the end of an age. Uh, we've heard about birth pangs, so something is going to come of it, uh, but it's still pretty scary. And we've heard about betrayals and violence. And then yesterday we were hearing uh, signs in the sky. Um, the sky turning dark, uh, the sun and the moon not giving light, that kind of thing. And we also heard about a fig tree. So we got that added in. Uh, and that's where we're going to pick up. So, so we're talking about this coming, uh, what many of us talk about as that second coming um, of, uh, of Jesus. The end of an age, the beginning of a new age. Uh, and Jesus speaks to that. So here we go, Matthew 24. 36 to 51, Jesus is speaking. But about that day, an hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as, uh, as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken. One will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Who then is the faithful and wise slave, whom his master has put in charge of his household to give the other slaves their allowance of the food of the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked slave says to himself, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know. He will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There we go. Pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> oh, so what are we to make of it? Well, as some of you will probably um, appreciate, uh, we've got lots of visions like this, don't we? Um, this is sort of the, the vision of the rapture, uh, that Jesus comes and some people are lifted up and some stay. And then, of course, we get books and stories and they'll stay because the world will burn and they will burn in them and the world will become hell, but they'll be lifted, the others are lifted up with God into heaven. Um, lots of people have predicted uh, the rapture, um, even, I don't know, a couple, couple three years ago, as I well, maybe five years ago, uh, there was a date and they knew it was going to happen. And if it happened, well, I, I didn't hear about it and I'm guessing you, you didn't either. Um, there's this idea of escaping the world and, and, and this passage does give, that lang does, does give you that language. This is probably where I, where I tend to lean uh, or side with the historians a little bit in terms of um, uh, whether Jesus said this or whether Matthew has said this and put them Put these words into Jesus's mouth. Uh, the imagery speaks to me of somebody who has witnessed or is in the midst of violence, um, great violence, um, and and so um, yeah, these feel more like Matthew words to me than Jesus words. And but that might just be because I find them scary and therefore don't want anything to do with them. We've talked about that um, earlier this week. Um, but the idea that that. The second coming of the Lord is likened unto a thief breaking into your house? That, that seems odd for me. It doesn't seem, I don't think Jesus would say that. And I think Matthew saying it actually is mixed his metaphors a little bit. Um, I mean, these are all sort of uh, negative things that, that we should be afraid that the master is coming. Right? The second coming, the son of man, we should be terrified. And yet... And yet just earlier we were hearing about birth pangs, which is which is a positive thing. Painful and difficult, but positive. And, and I mentioned uh, earlier this week, um, you know, those of us who are afraid of this ending tend to be those who have 
privilege and comfort, but those who are not privileged, who do not have comfort, who struggle and suffer, the end of this age is a lovely idea. So again, I, I think I've said before that I, I do believe that Jesus shared an apocalyptic prophecy. Um, they were common for the time. Um, and I think that Matthew is recalling it, but I think that Matthew is uh, recalling it sympathetic to the time in which Matthew is living. A time of insurrection, a time of rebellion, uh, a, a time of violence and fire and people having to run and flee. Uh, and that's all coming in here. So so the, the language becomes very difficult. I also hear a very stern one, a stern person. Th that same way that we sometimes threaten our children um, and then... I think probably later think back, oh, I wish I hadn't done that one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'll give you something to cry about. You know, that kind of thing. Feels to me like Matthew is doing a little bit of that. Um, who then is the faithful and wise slave, he asks. Well, I, I hope I am. I hope I'm wise and slave. You know, the, the master's put you in charge of his household. So again, we could be talking about religious leaders. Uh, we could be talking about just, just, just sort of people of faith. Uh, to give the other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time, like we are, we have been given a, a ministry, right? Which is which is to to feed the hungry and 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 clothe the naked and 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 uh, and care for our neighbor. So blessed is the one, blessed is the slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. So when the second coming comes, if you're doing that work, good for you. But if you've decided, well, cheapers, I thought he was coming back any time now, and he hasn't yet. Uh, I don't have to worry about it, right? I, I, you know, and so I think that that Matthew is speaking of of a corruption that has occurred, a moral corruption, perhaps people uh, less keen. When you go back and read Paul's letters, there is this sense that Jesus is coming back at any moment, and you got to don't be even got bother getting married. Paul will tell you because because it's happening any moment now. Okay, but. When Matthew's gospel was written, okay, we have passed, we are, we are 40 years, some would say even more. We're about 40 years past the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And he hasn't come back yet. And so, you know what, there was a certain fervor for a generation and now it's dying out. And I think that, that Matthew is, is getting tough with people. And reminding you, yeah, he can come back at any second and you better be doing the right thing. And not, by the way beating your fellow slaves, eating and drinking with drunkards. So to me, that speaks to something that's probably happening around 70, uh, not what was going on around 30. Um, so, uh, which isn't to say Jesus didn't share a, 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 um, an apocalyptic prophecy, uh, but I think that, that Matthew is, is, is coloring it. Because again, the other thing that jumps out at me, um, he eats and drinks with drunkards. My master's not coming. He's not here. He's delayed. So I'm beating my fellow slaves and I'm eating and drinking with drunkards. Well, beating his fellow slaves, uh, that probably is speaking to something very specific. But eats and drinks with drunkards? Do I need to remind you what Jesus did when he was around? Uh, he ate and drank with all sorts of people. Surely some of them were drunkards. He ate and drank with the marginalized. Uh, and, in, and in fact, references... Even in this gospel, uh, you know, saying that uh, when 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 Paul uh, came, you said, ah, he's a weirdo. He doesn't need anything. When I'm out, you say, yeah, you're a drunkard because you eat and drink all the time. Um, there's no winning. OK, that's a really bad paraphrase, but but you get the point. It's very strange to me uh, to imagine Jesus um, saying that we would be at fault because we were eating and drinking with drunkards. But I understand Matthew and people of Matthew's time trying to hang on to the faith and remind people um, that they have uh, that they have a morality, they have an ethic, uh, they do not abuse each other, and they don't give themselves to licentiousness. Ooh, there's my five dollar word for the day. Um, so I, I I can see that, but it feels more like Matthew than it does like Jesus. Um, so so what? My big thing is that um, this is an, an invitation for me to wonder about now, 2021. So as I hear these words and I wonder, well, it seems to me that what Jesus said then, uh, what Matthew carried forward, 
uh, is this idea that all ages do come to an end, but we don't know when it's going to be. I know it sells books and it gets people excited if I if you can put a date on it and tell you exactly how it's going to happen. But here, Jesus seems to say very clearly about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Again, we can talk about the Trinity and how it is that the Father can know something that the Son doesn't know, but that is another discussion, and that is part of the mystery of our faith. Uh, Jesus is uh, is a is a discreet uh, individual in this moment, um, at one with the Father, but still in conversation with the Father. So there are things that the Son does not know. And we're reminded that, yeah, you think things are fine or you think things are worried, has nothing to do with when that when that moment comes, when this age will end. So for all the signs, and when I read the signs as we've read them all week, Jesus says these things will happen, but they don't they don't cause the end of the age. Uh, Jesus says these things will happen, um, but they will happen. And then comes the end of the age so that we shouldn't suddenly jump and go, oh my gosh, those kingdoms are at war. That must be the end of the age. No, th those things are all going to happen. And the end of the age. So stuff is going to happen and we need to deal with it. Um, not sort of wait, go, oh, that stuff happening? Oh, cool, that's the end of the age, so might as well sit back and just let it go. Well, no, that makes us the one who just sort of sits back, beats the slaves, and, and eats with, uh, with, uh, with drunkards. Um, but in fact, I, I believe the call here is for us to live faithfully, always, <laughs> so that when this age ends, there is nothing that we say to ourselves, oh, I wish we had done that. I wish I had done that. No, no, we have done what we can do. It's not enough to sit back and go, well, the environment seems to be pretty rough. I guess we're done now. I might as well just hide until the end of this age. No, no, we are meant to be working at it. We are meant to be fighting uh, against the degradation of creation. We are meant to be living with creation in a positive, helpful way. And that can be interpreted a bunch of different ways, but we're meant to be working at it, not opting out saying, well, it's too late. It's never too late. At least that's what I get in this sense here. Yes, the age will end, but you can't know when it's going to end. And even though you're positive, we've done it now, you keep working at it. And that's important to me. You know, at a time when, 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 uh, when our relationship with the environment has, well, we are, we are paying. Uh, the consequences have arrived. And, um, and there are some who want to say, well, it's, it's, it's all too late. We might as well just give it up. But I hear this passage and it makes me want to try even harder. Uh, there are those who look around uh, at the level of public discourse and the way politics have played out around the world. And we go, oh gosh, we're all done. Humanity's finished. And I just want to give up. But I hear this passage and I go, no, no, just because I'm sure that means the end, I am reminded that nobody knows about the end of this age. About that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the sun. Jesus isn't going to tell me when it is. Only God knows when the age will end. And so I need to live in the age as if it is always going to continue. When the end comes, it will come. Um, and yes, there's also that frightening image, of, I, I suppose, of two women grinding meal. One's taken, one will be left. Um, the thing is, it's going to happen and there's nothing that you can do about it. And in fact, I would suggest to you, some of that imagery reminds us that as you're looking at people, you can't tell. You can't really tell who's faithful, who is fit for heaven, uh, and who's not. Because there were two women grinding meal together. One was taken, one was left. I don't know. Could you tell the difference between the two? They were both grinding meal. Um, two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Could you tell the difference? No. This invites me to work on my faith and how I live faithfully with God. And reminds me that I don't need to start looking at people and judging and deciding who's among the elect and who's not, who's fit, who isn't, who's faithful, who's not. Because in fact, in this vision, I can't tell. And so in this life, I can't tell either. So what I need to do is to keep doing my work. And so I will, 
I will work for um, the preservation, for the, uh, the, the, the healing of creation. I will work at that, whether you are or not. And I will work one way and you may work another way. And I will not know for sure whether you're right or I'm right. I just know that we are doing the best that we can. And if you opt out, I don't need to judge that because that just detracts me, distracts me from doing the work that I need to do. If I notice that you're not loving the neighbor, I don't need to sit there and yell at you for not loving the neighbor. I'm just going to go on and love the neighbors that will let me love them. Because that's what I need to do. I'm reminded that when the end of the age comes, it's not just that that when the master returns and sees me working, we'll go, oh, good for you, Norm. Thank you so much. Come on. Big hug. You're coming home with me. It's not that. Um, because I find that a little bit problematical. Uh, but it is that when the end of the age comes, I am not racked with guilt. What if I'd done this? What if I tried that? What if I'd done this? What if I did that? No, I have done my things. I have not maybe done enough, but I have done things. Um, what pops into mind, and maybe it's because one of the things that I do professionally, of course, is deal with families in grief and, uh, and, and around death. And uh, I, I think of those people who have, um, who have uh, lived with uh, aged parents and, and had strong or, or any kind of partner, but, but, but had a strong relationship and loved them and been with them and done all that they can. And when that loved one dies, there is a sense of release and relief. There is sadness, but there is, okay. We said all that we needed to say. We did all the things that we could try to do. When my loved one died, they knew that I loved them and I know that they love me. And everything has been done. There is a sense of completeness to that. I then look at the other people within that family unit who have not been there, uh, have never been around or rarely been around or decided there were other priorities. Uh, and then that person dies and suddenly they are racked with grief. They are racked with guilt. Uh, and those are the ones who come to me and start making demands about what I have to do at a funeral or how I have to do this or what I have to do for that or what I have to do for the surviving partner or why didn't I do a better job and how is it that I'm such a crappy minister that they feel bad. When the end of the age comes, I don't want to be yelling at somebody else but what a crappy minister they are because I feel bad. When the, age, the end of the age comes, I want to know that I have done all that I can do, that I, I want... I want creation to know that I love it, <laughs> that I am part of it. I want, I want God to know um, that I am grateful for this life that I have. Uh, I want to know that somewhere along the way I have done some good. I want to be able to know that. I will have some guilt because I, I know of all the opportunities I've missed and the things that I didn't do as well as I could. But I also want to be able to go, yes, but I did this and I did that and have a sense of completeness. For me, that's what's going on here. Jesus is reminding us that we don't know when it's going to happen. We can't really judge when it's going to happen. But the idea is to live as if it could happen at any moment. And if it doesn't happen in our lifetimes, that's okay too. Because the way that we live faithfully is worthwhile. As soon as I hear those words, I realize I'm preaching. I'm going to stop right now. Let me offer a prayer. Loving God, the end of an age is scary. And we're not sure what to make of it. We are sometimes, I am sometimes, selfishly motivated. I don't want to hurt. I want to love when it is easy. I want to feel safe in transition. But God, I realize that sometimes things have to be hard. But I also realize, God, that whatever comes, you are with me. You are with us all. We do all of this with you, guiding us, loving us, inspiring us. So God, thank you for the inspiration of today. Thank you for wherever the wandering leads. God, may it lead us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Oh, man. Well, that's enough for me. I, uh, I hope you have a fabulous weekend. I hope you enjoy the weekend. I hope that you, um, perhaps a new age happens for you. Um, so if, if there's stuff you need to let go, I hope you get to let go of that with the week and reemerge uh, through the weekend into the next week uh, new, that it's a new age. Um, but whatever age you're in, old or new, please know that you are not alone. God is with you. God loves you and God loves through you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday.